So thank you. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to do is talk today about the search uh, spectroscopic binaries in the protoplanetary or preplanetary network. And I call it expanding the search because I have talked about this in the previous 8 p.m. meeting, but I want to update that so that uh, you can see what, where we are at present. Uh, a number of collaborators trying to get good velocity coverage. And I'll talk briefly then about, about the motivation for this, the expectations, what do we expect to see, uh, what we observe, and the results and implications. Okay, so what do we expect? Well, let me just illustrate this. Uh, suppose we have a, a central star of six tenths of the solar mass with a main uh, sequence companion of half a mass, just to give us an idea. If the PPN is just within its Roche lobe as a G star, then it'll have a size of about 90 uh, solar radii. So the other star going around it would have a period of about a year. And that would give us a velocity semi amplitude of 13 kilometers a second. Now, of course, it, you know, we may not be looking edge on, but even at 30 degrees, it doesn't drop it uh, all that much. But if the BPN is just within its Roche lobe at the tip of the AGB, then the companion has to be much further away to uh, uh, have not uh, interacted within the uh, atmosphere while it was at the tip of the AGB. So that puts the stars much further apart. About 2.3 AUs uh, gives us an orbital period not of one, but 11 years, and consequently reduces the velocity semi amplitude. And just another illustration here, if, it, if you had a 30-year orbit, the velocity semi amplitude would be 4.5 kilometers a second. So some of the expectations. So we're going to search for binaries by radio velocity monitoring. I think I may have missed one. I'll miss this one and uh, learn how to use this. Uh, so why am I looking at post-AGB protoplanetary or pre-planetary nebulae? Uh, of course, the shaping of the planetary nebula we know about. We've heard the discussions about this being due to binaries. But protoplanetary nebulae have a distinct advantage in searching for companions spectroscopically. I mean, it's the preceding stage. We can see that much shaping has already occurred in these. Uh, but they're spectroscopically easier because the central stars, many of these, the ones I've chosen, are F and G type stars. They've got more relatively narrower lines than one finds in planetary nebulae. So we get better precision, and we don't expect such strong winds to contend with. And some clearly do show uh, an obscured region, a torus perhaps. So you know, how, how are these formed in shape, and is it a binary? OK, so I gave an idea of what one might expect observationally. And now let me go on to the targets. I picked seven of the brightest ones, began this uh, a number of years ago. Uh, since I was involved in identifying some of these protoplanetary nebulae, I got relatively early started looking at velocities. And so in the early 90s, I began this work. What I found was that they indeed varied. It was periodic, but it was associated with pulsation. But I just, uh, with the interest that there is in binaries, I restarted this program then in 2007. Uh, here's, you know, it's done in this, here's the wavelength region, the precision that we have. And then this, uh, this is also uh, joined with collaborations at the Mercator Telescope with Hans and with the Green and Steve 
And so we are using a spectrograph that even gives us better precision. So we're combining these data. So here, here's one object, probably the best case for variability. Here are the observations from the early 90s show variability that turns out to be periodic. I've got better data than that. But here's the data from the early 90s and 2007 on. This one shows a clear difference. Uh, it comes out to three and a half kilometers per second uh, over 25 years. Now, I'm not going to try to put a radio velocity curve through these, uh, but I mean clearly if there's a period to it, it's longer than 25 years. And if I use that number and a semi amplitude of half of this difference, we get some limiting case. Uh, which we can see in the model. So what does it give us? Well, I need the inclination, but uh, Toshimita did a model on this with IR imaging to get an idea of the inclination of the torus. And if I use that uh, inclination of 25, I get mass of the secondary about four tenths of a solar mass. So circular orbit puts an 8 AU, uh, clearly large enough to have a state then spiral in the tip of the AGB. Okay, so possibly that one's a binary, certainly varying in velocity. Uh, here are three others of these uh, seven. They show no long-term variations. Where available, I've shown the whole uh, image. And here's the uh, final three of these. Uh, no variation. This one, which is uh, now appears to show some variation, a difference, a step difference of, of about uh, two and a half kilometers a second. I've not tried to put something through this. Uh, I think that would be premature. But there is a second one. So uh, two of the seven show some long-term variations beyond pulsation. But two of seven is agreeable with what one finds spectroscopic binary, F and G binaries in the field. So uh, that's, I'm, I'm not sure that tells us anything uh, special about this. Okay, but however, and one can say, well, they're, of course, you're doing the very brightest ones. You know, if they are bipolar, uh, then you're probably looking close to the face on, you're looking uh, pole on to them. That's why they're so bright and they're not obscured. But, uh, you know, e even if we follow up on that, we still set important constraints. The non-detection of the other five uh, allows us to constrain what a secondary might be if it were there. Uh, here's uh, some calculations for various values of M2 and the period uh, at various inclinations, assuming uh, some typical values for the mass and a you know, fairly generous semi-amplitude of two kilometers a second. Yeah, because that would have, that's not seen in these other five. And so examples of uh, just trying to interpret this graph, if we had a companion four tenths of a solar mass, uh, this is I equals 15 degrees. So at that the period would have to be longer than three and a half years to escape detection. Uh, if we have 30 degrees, then the period would have to be longer than 25 years to escape detection. Go down to a, a lower mass secondary, and even at 45 degrees, uh, the period would have to be longer than 23. So we've excluded uh, high mass or uh, close uh, secondary companions. So any undetected binaries are low mass or hot secondary. Now, ideally it would be nice to look at ones that we thought were edge-on, so we didn't have to worry about the inclination. But the ones that are edge-on have an obscuring torus. Here are the examples, some well-known ones, invisible light. However, each of these does have a star that you can see in the near infrared. So this provides an opportunity to exploit uh, the near infrared uh, uh, observation of the star. So each of these has a star that can be seen in the center. Uh, 
These orientations are different from the one above, so nothing's uh, changed. But you can see the nebula in the near infrared, and you can see the central star. Please. Okay, thank you. So, ideally, we want to observe them in the near infrared. And here's an example of one of those. Here's the mid infrared, so you can actually see the ends of the torus, limb right. And then here's the visible where you see where that torus would be. So we began this observing program four years ago. So I'm, I'm describing the observations that we have uh, of it with high resolution spectrograph. Uh, now, I'm not going to, I'm not expecting to get 20 years on an 8 meter telescope to try to replicate that. Uh, that would be nice. One of you in the back can continue that. But uh, if, you know, if we saw the, the pulsation <coughs> full amplitude is 15 or 20 kilometers per second. So if we saw something larger than that, that would certainly commend we were seeing more than pulsation and uh, perhaps a lot more. Here's the um, one that we have the highest signal to noise in this best study, the one of those three. Atmosphere. So here are some lines that we can get velocities of. We have observations from 2011, 2013, perhaps some real variation. This though is what I can regard as the systemic velocity from the OH masers. So this one may be tantalizing that that uh, you know these are 10 kilometers a second different than the systemic, but clearly you need a longer temporal baseline to, uh, to determine that. And the other two, oh, excuse me. Uh, the other two we have just very preliminary results and, and the reduction is hard because the lower signal to noise are just kind of messy. So, implications. The implications of small or no long-term velocity variations are that the binaries have to have long periods or have low masses have sub-stellar, sub uh, Then one does have to think about, you know, if they're too long, you know, are they going to shape them to give us those tight torus that we saw on the edge on? And the fact that these are presently F and G supergiants with large circumstellar envelopes indicates that they're clearly not going to pass through the common envelope phase, and they haven't, and they won't. And so, common envelope isn't going to explain these objects. I feel pretty convinced they're going to turn into planetary nebulae, but they're not going to do it through a common envelope. And just lastly, you know, a lot of, a lot of observations went into seeing, in some cases, no clear evidence of variability. Uh, but uh, we, we have gotten a good return in studying the pulsational variability of these stars. Here's the one that had the uh, uh, difference of three kilometers a second. Looking at some of the data, we see a nice light curve, color curve, and pulsational curve. So we're getting nice velocity studies out of this. And let me just conclude by saying, you know, where are the binaries? I'm looking for them. Maybe there are a couple in the sample um, at best. Uh, well, to, to the extent we know that. Uh, and these studies are going to be continued. Thank you very much. Yes, questions, answers. Also, I use
seven stars, how many of them would you think, since they're going to become planetary nebulae, how many of them would you expect to be seen as binaries? Well, then the periods are really, really long, right? I mean, do most. So I think we could detect binaries here with periods of 50 years. So the ones that escape would likely have quite, quite large separations and then you know how, how much that's going to shape to give us this tight waste, I, I guess, other than I leave those calculations to others. Uh, okay, so let's move to Peter Wood. Peter Wood is from Australia.